welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. And thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Just a quick reminder that Just and Center as an organization is donor supported. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Please do consider helping us out financially with all of the needs that we have. You can go to justincenter.org, go to the donate page there, and you can, you can help us out. There are different ways that you can donate uh, to help fund this ongoing ministry that uh, we have in educating people theologically, uh, specifically with uh, Lutheran theological education. So uh, we have a couple new things as an organization that I want to announce. The first of those is that we are continuing our publication of Paul Kretzmann's popular commentary on the whole Bible. Uh, as we have mentioned on previous podcasts, and we just released, as I'm recording this, the commentary on First and Second Samuel. So it's a single volume on, that covers both First Samuel and Second Samuel. You can pick that up at jspublishing.org, along with the rest of the volumes in this series. We're publishing those pretty regularly. I am hard at work editing the uh, Petrus Naxkow volume, Articles of Faith, the Holy Evangelical Lutheran Church, set forth in 40 sermons. It's a long title. It's a wonderful book. I'm really excited about this one uh, that I've been hard at work editing for quite a while now. And this is going to be released March 15th. So you want to keep an eye out for that when that is released. And I'll be doing probably, I don't know if we'll be doing a whole program, but I'll at least be doing some kind of video on that and giving some description of, of what that work is about. Because I think it's really a really important one that I'm really, uh, really excited about. Along with that, we have an upcoming seminar. Uh, with the Widener Institute. So it's been a little while now since we've done a live seminar. We've been focusing our energy on some of our lay level courses as we released the Intro to the Christian Life course. And two others are being uh, recorded right now, one on apologetics and one on uh, law and gospel. Those are being worked on at the moment. Uh, but uh, as I've mentioned, we have some other seminars that are going to be coming up soon. So we have one at the end of February. This is with Dr. Mark Mattis on Martin Luther's Theology of Beauty. So you really want to check that out. You don't want to miss this. If you're there live, you can interact and ask questions. If you're not able to make it live and you do purchase the course or the, the seminar, you will receive a video of it afterwards. So even if you can't make it live, that's okay. Of course, the way to get the most out of it is to be able to be there and interact and ask your questions. So that's coming up at the end of this month. As I'm recording this, is February 2021. If you're listening to this or watching this way after that, you should be able to purchase the video of the event that happened uh, on justincenter.org. If you go to the Widener Institute uh, page, we have a whole catalog of, of video courses and seminars that are available for purchase there. So go ahead and check that material out. Well, um, this last week uh, it has been a little bit of a crazy one. This is, you know, it's the toward the end of the week that I'm recording this and I usually record on Mondays or record the week before and try to upload Monday. So we have a, a regular schedule, but there are times when things happen during the week and we have been snowed in for the last three days. <laughs> so uh, here in upstate New York, it's been kind of kind of crazy with, with the amount of snowfall that we've had. So we've had two kids home from school for three days. And then my youngest son had a exposure to COVID at school. So he's supposed to be at home for a week. So he is here. So if you hear some noise in the background, that's why. But uh, so it's been kind of hard to record with, with kids home uh, and, that kind of changes the schedule. So uh, I, I'm doing this a little later than usual, but as promised, I, I am getting our regular weekly podcast in. It's just a little bit of a different time than usual. So on the podcast today, I'm gonna to be talking about the two natures of Christ. And this is something that I've wanted to talk about for a while is the unique Lutheran approach to this. We're not just talking about the two natures in you know, classical Christology, though we certainly could do some programs just going through classical Christology, going through the ecumenical creeds, the debates with Arius. And this is something I've actually kind of wanted to do for a while. I think that would be an enjoyable thing to do is go through some of those early Christological controversies, talk about them and you know, present what the conclusions of those councils were and where these things are found in, in scripture. So we may be doing uh, some of that in the future. Let me know below in the comments or send an email uh, or wherever, Twitter, Facebook, all those places. Let me know that you want to see that because it's something that I definitely would be interested in doing, delving into some more church history on some of these questions. Um, as I'm working my way through my, my uh, contemporary Protestant scholastic theology book series, uh, I, I'm working on 
the third volume right now, but I will be working on a volume in Christology, so I'm brushing up and some reading in that area as well. And I realized I've never actually done a full program on the subject of the communication of attributes from the divine to the human nature of Christ. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, not just Christology in general, but this unique debate that occurred in the post-Reformation era between Luther and Zwingli, which still is a debated issue today in the church. So we'll be delving some into that. I published an article with Modern Reformation in December on this very issue, talking about the Lutheran reform differences on, on Christology. So if you wanna check that out, um, you can go to, I'm trying to think of how to find an easy link to that, go to jordanbcooper.com. That's a, That has links to all of my articles and books if you wanna check that out. I know I'm just giving you a ton of links, sorry, but uh, <laughs> these are resources if you want if you want to check them out, they're there for you. So I, I address some of these these differences kind of on a broader scale. So we're going to delve into what the communication of attributes is, what the deal is with this controversy, and then delve into some of the the biblical foundations and theological foundations of this. I'm going to be referring to a few different sources here. One of these is uh, River Franklin Widener's Christology. We are going to be we are republishing this. I'm working on it right now, uh, but this is the old the old volume. Uh, if you can find yourself a copy, I think this cost me like 80 bucks or something to to get because I couldn't find it anywhere, um, and it's not even in great shape. <laughs> but we will be re-releasing that as well. It's something I'm I'm working on. We're over halfway done with that. Uh, but then I'm also I also in preparation for this just read through Gerhard's on Christ the section on the communication of attributes. I read the rest of this volume, but the first half of this volume in the past, but I decided to actually go back to it and finish it, which is something I've been meaning to do. Um, Gerhard is is a lot to read through, uh, if you are not aware, if you haven't read Gerhard, but it's, he's excellent. A lot of really great detailed treatment. So I'll be dealing with that somewhat. Um, and then I also have uh, Leonard Hutter's Compound of Lutheran Theology that I will probably be referencing here as well, which is a volume that we publish get it just jspublishing.org okay so and then of course i'll be dealing with scripture i mean that's the most important thing right we'll be looking at scripture as we get into some of these uh passages that we'll be talking about now this may be something i do for multiple programs i don't know what we'll get through there's a lot related to this discussion and i think the best way to start is to just talk about some of the historical debates and set the context for uh, for this discussion so um the, the debate about Christology, which is really at the center of the divide between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions, which you wouldn't think. I mean, usually we think of the two traditions as differing in the sacraments, and we think, well, Christology. I mean, they all hold to the ecumenical councils. We're all agreed there, so what, what could be the big Christological debate? Well, this ended up really being the dividing line between Luther and, and Zwingli. So it's well known that Luther and Zwingli, uh, the Swiss reformer Zwingli, Ul Ulrich Zwingli, they had a bit of a disagreement, a uh, bit of a disagreement on, on a number of issues, actually. I think that the disagreement between them is is minimized by a lot of people, and it's minimized to make Luther sound like he's just being obnoxious and Luther is just being nitpicky. At least that's how the Reformed historians tend to portray Luther in, in the exchanges between them. And the argument is often made, well, Luther and Zwingli really agreed on everything except for you know, the question of kind of how they differed in terms of the mode of the Lord's Supper, and really they weren't that far apart on, on these various issues, on all the other issues. Now, there are a number of issues where Luther and Zwingli depart from one another. You know, that while they were able to agree on a number of articles of, of agreement at the Marburg Colloquy, where they had this, this gathering or meeting, which didn't end well exactly, they were able to agree on a number of points. But even when you look at those points and where they agree, they're not really often saying the same thing in in the places where where they do um, say that they have verbal agreement. And you see this really playing out more so in the second generation of reformers, where you have, especially through Calvin and then later Beza, you have people like Martin Chemnitz, uh, Jacob Andre, and others who are involved in dialogue with the reformed and trying to hash out these these things in more in some more detail. But nonetheless, Luther and Zwingli um, sat down for the Marburg Colloquy, and they weren't the only individuals there. They were representative of the two parties. There was a, a desire for the Lutheran and Reformed churches to work together. At this point, they're not you know fully formed churches, but as we have this reform movement in these two different areas, of course, we're going to see various reform movements, you know, in the Church of England and, and other places as well. 
Uh, but kind of the two heavy hitters initially in the era of the Reformation were Luther and Zwingli, and they each had plenty of criticisms of Rome and uh, suggestions as to how to correct um, what had gone wrong in the medieval period of the medieval church. And they were in agreement on a number of issues, including justification by faith alone. Um, there may be some differences in terms of how that worked itself out between the two, but generally they were agreed on that. Uh, there were some big disagreements, such as the nature of worship. Uh, Zwingli very much had a stripped down, totally stripped down worship service, started preaching just straight through the, the book of Matthew. Um, Luther was very much in continuity with the church in worship, in excising parts of worship, but keeping the main structure of the mass in a way that Zwingli really was not doing. But it's natural that you see these two reform movements, there is going to be discussion because ideally, if you have reform movements, they're going to be stronger. I mean, politically, certainly, they're going to be stronger if they're working together. So if your sole concern is to have, you know, good political allegiance and alliances against Rome, then it would have made a lot of sense for Luther and Zwingli and their various reforms, their distinctive reform movements to come together. And you have a number of individuals that are kind of in between as well. Martin Bootser's the big name there who tends to kind of be a little bit back and forth between those two movements. So after some discussion, uh, Luther agrees to meet with Zwingli uh, at, at Marburg. So they meet at what's known as the Marburg Colloquy. And, you know, there are a number of different testimonies as to what happened at the Colloquy of Marburg, firsthand uh, accounts. You can, you can read those. And they all tell a little bit of a different story, a little bit of different details as anything kind of does. But, but they're all really agreed on generally a couple things. One is when Luther and Zwingli first met, there was a kind of cordiality between them before the discussions really started, started going. Uh, one of the historians makes the observation that they, they spoke as brothers. And I can't remember exactly whose testimony that was, but I know Philip Schaff cites that in his discussion of this. Um, so they, they seem to have cordiality between them, but and they went through a number of different doctrinal points. And as they went through these various doctrinal points, they, they found agreement here, agreement there. But eventually they stumbled on the issue of the Lord's Supper. And when they got to the question of the Lord's Supper, it was very apparent that Luther and Zwingli were not on the same page. Now, oftentimes when we think through this debate and the way it's portrayed, what we think about is the fact that this boiled down to the words of institution, which it does, you know, that's certainly a portion of the debate, but it's not the entirety of it. And in this debate about the words of institution, Luther just repeats, this is my body. Hulk est corpus meum. He like writes it on the table and keeps pointing at it. And um, one account says he's like pounding on the table and then just repeating it over and over again. And, and for Luther, this is my body. Hulk est corpus meum means this is my body. And that's the end of the story. So Jesus said, this is my body. So this is Christ's body. Now Zwingli rejected that interpretation of the words of institution and said no that the lord's supper was not the the true body of christ but it was a representation of christ's body and zwingli would contend that is in that context means represents uh, this bread represents the body of christ the blood represents or the wine represents the blood of christ luther of course uh, fought against that eventually this debate between them meant that Luther would not shake Zwingli's hand at the end of the colloquy, uh, and he said, we are of a different spirit. This meant the end of any cooperation between Luther and Zwingli. Now, Luther was a man of principles. He was not the kind of guy who would, for the sake of political expediency, just work together with somebody to take down Rome. Luther kind of ended up pointing his guns more toward the sacramentarians, as he called them, than he did Rome itself. He saw this as an even bigger danger than what had gone on in, in the medieval church. Now, you can agree or disagree with Luther on that, but that's certainly Luther's perspective. And what I think we're, we're often missing when we do just discuss the nature of the words of institution is the underlying principle that was there in the debate that they disagreed upon. And that was the question of Christology. And, and essentially, it's this. Zwingli really made his stance on the words of institution and interpreted the words of institution based upon what was a philosophical axiom that he was very convinced of was, was true. 
and that is the axiom that the finite is not capable of the infinite. He would say that if the, for the finite to have something infinite, that is that's a logical impossibility. It's a contradiction. And so Melanchthon was, you know, humanist, and Luther to, to some degree was as well. Melanchthon more so than Luther, but I think we'd be wrong to say that humanism had no impact on, on Luther's development of thought. It's it's very important for just the world of, of education in that in that period. Just the fact that he's going back to the original sources of scripture itself is kind of going with the mantra of the humanist back to the the sources ad fontes. So Luther. Um, or Zwingli says, you know, the finite is not capable of the infinite. And so therefore, the body of Christ cannot be in the sacrament. The reasoning is this, essentially. For Luther, the body of Christ that we receive in communion is the actual body of Christ. Zwingli says, well, for that to happen, that would mean that Christ's physical body is more than in more than one place at a time because it has to be on the altar of every church where communion is being received. And you can have you know, thousands of churches all across the world, all meeting at once and all celebrating the same supper. Does that mean that Christ's body is like stretched out among those churches or that little pieces of his body are taken off and put in, in different locales? Zwingli has a problem with this. He has a problem with this for two reasons. One is the axiom, simply that the finite is not capable of the infinite. And if Christ, if were to have to be present more than one place at a time, he would have something divine in his human nature, which is omnipresence, essentially. So if Christ were to have omnipresence, that is an infinite attribute because God is infinite. So if the human nature has any infinite attributes, it, there, it therefore no longer is finite and is now infinite and is not human. And that neglects the incarnation and neglects the true humanity of Christ because of Zwingli's principle. And so Zwingli's principle really sets, sets him toward that. Now, the other part of the argument is going to be that the ascension is something that is local. So the argument is going to be from Zwingli that in the ascension, the bodily ascension of Christ, Christ's physical body was raised to heaven, is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And because Christ's human body is seated at the right hand of the Father, it cannot be present on earth because it's at the right hand of the Father. So how can it be present here if it's present there? So for Zwingli, the principle that uh, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father is a, a principle which determines the fact that he is literally physically there and only there. So he is spatially located and limited to one locale, which is at the right hand of the Father. Now, Luther contends that the phrase the right hand of the Father is not about a physical locality, but the right hand is about a seat of authority. Now, to, to some degree, we all have to acknowledge that there is, is anthropomorphism here, meaning that there is language referring to the divine in, in human phraseology with human ideas that we can understand that explain something to us that is true about God. Uh, and why I say we all have to accept that is because, well, I mean, the, the picture here is he's at the right hand of the Father. Now, if we're going to take this literally as a, as a, fac a spatial statement, that we want to take it in the most literal sense, we can have this picture of, you know, God the Father seated at a throne, and at his literal right hand, sitting next to him, is Jesus on a literal throne, unable to move, right? Oh, and, and, you know, that may work in a Mormon context where there are three personages and um, you know, separate gods and for the father with a physical body and things like that. But uh, Orthodox Christians, of course, aren't going to come down on that perspective. We acknowledge and understand that God is spirit, as scripture says. Uh, he does not have a physical body. So we have to understand that there's anthropomorphism there somewhere. And so I think the, the criticism from the Reformed, by the way, is often going to be that the Lutherans are literalistic with their language. Right. They're going to say, well, you Lutherans, you don't allow for any metaphor because you say this is my body and you just insist on taking it literally and you're really misunderstanding like the nuances of grammar and metaphor and those kinds of things. And, and that's really not a very good criticism. And the reason why it's not a very good criticism is Lutherans are very much willing to acknowledge that there are phrases that signify things like, you know, we have anthropomorphisms. Uh, we have uh, pl plenty of symbolic language in scripture. We acknowledge that the book of Revelation is very symbolic. Uh, 
uh, we don't interpret the book of Revelation in the way that the dispensational premillennialist does. Uh, we understand, as they said, Luther understands the right hand of the Father not as a literal physical statement, but as a statement that is an anthropomorphism, explaining what God is like and explaining the seat of authority that Christ has. So it's not a question of do we take everything literally or do we take nothing literally? It's in context and grammatically, is there precedent for taking this literally or not? And of course, the, the straightforward reading of the text should be our go-to unless there is sufficient evidence and sufficient textual evidence, grammatical evidence, that it should be taken otherwise. So when we're coming to a passage like this, speaking of the right hand of the Father, um, through a, a number of different reasons, and you can look at Gerard's explanation of this, we may go through some of this, we have sufficient evidence to say that that should be taken, not be taken in a literal physical sense. But what we don't have in the words of institution is something like that. Okay, so um, the words of institution grammatically mean what it says, and contextually as well. If you look at the context of this being the Passover and Christ is the new Passover lamb, they eat the actual lamb, they don't need a symbol of the lamb on, on the Passover. There, so there's this whole context that's going on there as well. This being Jesus' last will and testament. Here's a place where he's, he's not in the same context of you know, teaching publicly, where he is trying to you know, communicate things in a way that the disciples understand, but the Pharisees don't, because you see Jesus does do this. But he's giving them a very clear instruction that is to be carried out exactly. We also see the interpretation of that instruction by St. Paul, who speaks about partaking of, of the body of Christ, partaking of the blood of Christ. So we, we, have, we have ample reason to simply take the text for what it says. Um, even at one point in the Institutes, and I don't have the quote on me right now, but I, I believe I cited it in The Great Divide. But there's a place in the Institutes where, where Calvin, in, in debating this issue and arguing for his perspective, even at one point comes down to say, we shouldn't subject Christ to the usual rules of grammar. Uh, because he even acknowledges in these debates that according to the ordinary rules of grammar, this certainly seems to be what it says, that this is the body of Christ. You have a hard time arguing that this represents the, the body of Christ. So, uh, but we're not going to get too much into the, the Lord's Supper issues, but that's the background that we really need to understand to understand what's going on in these Christological debates so that it really arises in the context of debates surrounding the Lord's Supper, but it really is a much bigger issue than that. It's a bigger issue than that. And some critics of Luther will end up saying that, well, Luther just kind of came up with this weird theory as a way to defend against Zwingli on the Lord's Supper. So he came up with this idea that, well, actually there's a communication of divine attributes to the human nature. And that really wasn't thought through very well. It was just kind of a knee-jerk response to, to Zwingli's criticisms because he had to have an answer to this whole finite cannot contain the infinite thing. And I don't think that's really the case at all. In fact, I, I think that Luther has this intimate um, this understanding of the intimate relation between God, the transcendent God, and the physical earthly creation. We see that kind of theme throughout Luther's writings and throughout his theology in so many ways. And I do think that this is demonstrated in a lot of just the kind of trajectory of the Reformed churches versus the Lutheran churches. So let me give you some examples of this. Um, think about you know, kind of the, the Reformed, if you read a lot of Reformed theology proper, um, Reformed doctrine of God or Reformed doctrines of worship, for example, there is a very high emphasis on the transcendence of God, God's transcendence. Um, there is a strong emphasis on the sin of idolatry. Uh, Bovink points this out. He says kind of the, for the reform, the chief sin is idolatry. For the Lutherans, it's self-righteousness. Uh, maybe that's not always the case, but but I, I think it's a, it's, you know, it's a generalization. So it goes as far as generalizations go. But uh, I think he is generally correct in, in seeing that. So that the reformed tend to so highly emphasize what is the creator-creature distinction that they are wary of any talk which appears to blur that. Uh, you see this especially in, I think, Vantilians, uh, 
uh, those who, who are presuppositionalists following Cornelius Van Til, they, they tend to fear any kind of language often of any participation or any commonality that, that the creation will have with, with the creator as a blurring of the line with the creature creator distinction. Um, but within Lutheran sources, you see much more of an emphasis on things like participation in metaphysics or, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the, especially if you read, you know, someone like Scott Oliphant and his criticisms of uh, Thomas Aquinas, I think you'll really see, see this understanding of transcendence that is very different from the kind of intimacy that you find in terms of, of the Lutheran uh, Reformation. The, the, the intimacy between the transcendent and uh, and the, the finite, or the infinite and the finite. Um, but, you know, I think this also generally is the case in what you see in a worship service. When you do look at the service of a more sacramental church, the service is much more visual. Uh, the service is much more focused on the senses. You're not going to see in a, and I'm not talking about Anglican, the Anglican tradition here, but in a reformed tradition, you know, if you go to an OPC church, you may go to the service where, you know, you've got just white walls everywhere and there's a giant pulpit in the front. There is no visual anything because that kind of distracts. And so you have, what you have then is um, a focus on just the theology that's behind the worship rather than the experience itself and the senses are almost purposefully not engaged because you work to kind of rise above this, you know, kind of physical stuff that's going on and understand the transcendent God who communicates to us through his word. So there's going to be emphasis on preaching. Uh, it's going to be much more of a kind of intellectual emphasis where even in, in Reformed churches where the Lord's Supper is, is celebrated, I've sometimes seen, um, I don't mean to suggest that yeah, I said that weirdly, but uh, what I mean is, okay, in, in Reformed churches, when they celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, I've seen at certain times that there is a kind of theological explanation of the Lord's Supper before the Lord's Supper. And it seems like the theology behind what's going on ends up being more important than the actual experience itself. And I do tend to think that this is the reason why you don't have the same kind of beauty in music and art in the reformed cultures that you do in the Lutheran or Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. If you think about great composers, you know, you think about a Bach or you think about a Vivaldi or you think about, um, you know, some of the, the, Ang the British Anglicans, because there is this, in this liturgical tradition, this emphasis on um, creation and beauty in creation, whereas it does tend to be the case that I think in Reformed traditions, you tend to look beyond and above creation. Sometimes the beauty of creation can even be seen as like a distraction from your focus on God. Whereas we would say that that which is in creation is a reflection of God as the infinite God comes into the world through that, precisely that which is finite. Um, I think you see some of the roots of the Reformed view there in Augustine, um, as, as you read Augustine's uh, work on 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 beauty and music. I mean, Augustine, you know, at one point in the Confessions even says that like he's afraid of singing because it's like too beautiful. It kind of, can kind of distract you. And yeah, there, there's a little bit of that, I th roots of some of that, I think, I think in Augustine. But he doesn't, so I don't think he goes all the way there that maybe happens later. Um, so there is a place where I think you see this principle more broadly being played out. You certainly see it in the sacraments. So the principle here, this, that the infinite or the finite is not capable of the infinite. If that's the case, then what you're going to do is separate the infinite God from the finite means of grace because they are finite, right? So when we're talking about sacraments, we're talking about things that are finite. Water is finite. Bread is finite. Wine is finite. The words from the pastor are finite. The words on the page of scripture are finite. So if that's the case, then... If there is this divide between the transcendent God and the finite things of this world, then we're going to have a, a stronger distinction between those two things. Because to say that the, the infinite God is um, connected or united to the finite in such a way that he is always there connected to it would seem to go against that general tenor of Zwingli's thought that develops within the Reformed tradition. 
Whereas for Luther, there is this high emphasis on the fact that the infinite God does come to us in these finite means. And he has indeed bound himself to these finite means, which to us makes no sense. Why would God do that? But, but he's told us that he, that he has. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, God can't work outside of those means in any circumstance whatsoever. But he has given us promises. And where God has given us concrete things that he has enacted his promises in, he has promised that he will be there every time. Because he's decided that. He has decreed that. He has proclaimed that to us. And if he has promised that to us, it's true. Because God's promises are always true. He does not break his promises. So that means that when Christ promises, this is my body broken for you. And when he promises, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. That's true. There, there, there's no you know, ifs, ands, or buts around that. So that when the church gathers to celebrate the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, it is what Jesus says it is. So we gather together and when we receive the body of Christ, it is the body of Christ because Christ has put his promise on that. Which is why we would say that that's true of the believer and the unbeliever. And here's a, a major difference here. And I've, I've said this many times, but this may be kind of the key to the whole debate in some ways is the question of the communication of the ungodly the com or the communion of the ungodly. Sorry. Um, the question of do the ungodly or unbelievers in the supper receive the body of Christ? Luther would respond unambiguously. He would say, uh, yes, this is the body of Christ. Because it is the body of Christ, not because of the, the faith of the recipient, not because of the posture of the heart of the recipient, but it is the body of Christ because of the objective promise of God and that God has decided to bind himself to it. So it is what he says it is. So again, you see the infinite God tying himself to the finite, where he says, this is my body, and the infinite God is, has, is present there in the body and blood of his son every time that is enacted. And we would say something similar about baptism. So that in the gift of, of holy baptism, this is the washing of regeneration. Um, it is the washing of regeneration always, not just sometimes. It is not just the washing of regeneration when the, the individual recipient has faith. It's not just the washing of regeneration when one is elect, or if God so decrees at that moment that that would be the case. It is always the washing of regeneration because the Holy Spirit has tied himself to that act, to that sacrament, and has promised that he will be there. In other words, the infinite God has tied himself to this finite means of grace, um, holy baptism. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who is baptized necessarily will receive the, the, the benefits of that regardless of their posture of faith. And that may sound confusing, but what we're saying is this. It is objectively what it is regardless of the faith of the recipient. The faith of the recipient, though, receives what that is for their own benefit, the unbelief of the recipient rejects what that is. So in other words, the objectivity is there because God has promised it to be there. But what that means for the subjective experience of the, of the individual receiving it, there you can reject that. It doesn't make it not the washing of regeneration, but you have now resisted the Spirit's work of regeneration. Of course, that is uh, distinct from the, the idea of an irresistible grace or, or an effectual call in that sense. Um, so that's, that's a place where we see this really, this broader principle just brought out really strongly. Um, so yeah, we, we see this in the reformed idea that you find, especially in the Westminster Confession of Faith, that God does use means of grace, right? So the reformed aren't going to say there, there are no means of grace, um, but they are going to distinguish between the infinite God and the finite means of grace so that the finite means of grace become the tool of regeneration or become a tool of, of, of grace when the, whole, the God the Father sovereignly decrees that it is going to be such. So that for the elect, God can use baptism to regenerate. Even so, God may not use baptism to regenerate the elect at the time of administration, meaning God will not bind himself even to the time of baptism. God can work outside of it altogether 
or God can work where the individual is baptized and then God later in life brings the grace of baptism to bear in that individual's life as he then regenerates the elect. Um, and then, you know, you see, of course, in hyper-Calvinism where there's this like total divergence between the two and there's no connection whatsoever where you have people who are converted and saved and have never heard anything about Christ and have never experienced a means of grace because it's just election is so free and div divorced from the means of grace that these things aren't connected at all. I do think you also find this, it's always very consistently played out in in Karl Barth and his Doctrine of Revelation. And, and you know, of course, a lot of Calvinists are gonna like that I'm saying this, but those who aren't, aren't Bardian, and I have some Bardians who listen out to the program as well, but um, Barth's Doctrine of Revelation very strongly differentiates God's work from the actual text of scripture. He speaks about, um, you know, revelation or scripture becoming the word of God. It becomes the word of God when it works upon us. So it is not objectively here the word of God, but God freely and sovereignly decides to work through it when and where he wills to then make that true to us. And that is God's act of, of revelation. So revelation is not objective revelation here, but revelation is in, in this kind of I thou encounter with me and, and God. Now, it's not like it's just those in the Reformed tradition that do this. You know, you can look at Rudolf Bultmann who's certainly behind a lot of this, but, but in some ways, I think it's a more consistent idea within the Reformed framework than the Lutheran. Because the Reformed framework does have this divorce between God and the means of grace so that he's sovereign over and above them in a way that he doesn't always have to work through and in them, but only when he sovereignly decrees that he will. So we can see how this idea can be applied to scripture in, in such a way that it, it results in that. Now, of course, I'm not saying that all the Reformed have the view of Bart of, of Revelation, but Bart does say things like he says, yeah, God can reveal himself through scripture, but he can also reveal himself through a dead dog. Um, really weird quote. <laughs> like, I don't know why he shows a dead dog. Um, and yes, I've read his uh, Church Dogmatics on the Doctrine of the Word of God. I've, I've read too much of Bart. Um, and, and I feel like it was a colossal waste of time because I'm not sure that I, after reading the like 2,000 pages of Bart I've read, I'm not sure I understand any better than when I did when I started. But, you know, I, I don't understand Bart scholars. Good luck to all of you. I don't know how you do it. But <laughs> I really don't. Um, I just think he's so convoluted and, and, you know, it's almost like he contradicts himself every other page. I mean, this is why you can find a Bart scholar that says that Bart believes almost anything because he's so all over the place in his writings. Um, anyway, okay, so that's neither here nor there. Now, another place, and I mentioned this in my Modern Reformation article, where you see this um, being applied is in the doctrine of theosis. So, and I mentioned this before, I've mentioned this quite a few times, that, you know, my, my latest book that I just, that's written, it's being edited right now, uh, it will be released the first half of this year. So that is a book on union with Christ or, or theosis. I already have one out, Christification, a Lutheran approach to theosis. This new one's going to be much more in depth. Uh, but you find in a lot of early Lutheran sources, a lot of utilization of the idea of theosis or these, this, this language that man becomes a partaker of the divine nature. So uh, you see this, we well, see this in Luther. I mean, look at uh, Tuama Monarma's work, Christ Present in Faith, where he studies union with Christ and Luther's, spends a lot of time in Luther's Galatians commentary. Now, I don't agree with all of Monarma's conclusions. I also don't agree with the lack of any idea of a forensic justification that especially comes in the the people following Monarma, I think that's really not consistent with Luther and certainly not consistent with the New Testament. So I, I think they kind of take this really valid um, theme in Luther and valid critique of a lot of Luther interpretation in the past, and they just kind of run with it way too far. But but I think Monarma does very much demonstrate that this theme of theosis certainly can be found in, in Luther's writings. And I think it is there in the Galatians commentary, I think it's there all, all over the place in Luther. Um, but something that I've tried to, to demonstrate is, because I'm not, I'm not a Luther scholar, uh, and you know I know plenty that are, and there are so many Luther scholars that it's not really something that I, I wanted to spend my time on. I love Luther and I, I utilize Luther all the time, but I tend to want to focus on the post, post-Reformation Lutheranism, 
uh, and the developments that occurred after Luther. That that's my area of interest more so. And you know, you see that from the program and from the books we publish, uh, because I think we have such a rich heritage that is so often missing because we focus so much on Luther. We don't even focus on Melanchthon enough. I mean, there's so much great stuff there as well. But um, what you see in a lot of the early Lutheran sources, and you look at uh, especially like a Johann Gerhard, this theosis language is all over the place. I mean, they're constantly talking about partaking of the divine nature. And that's a, that's a text from Second Peter, but it's not one of those texts that shows up occasionally. I mean, it, it is it is one of the most common texts cited by early Lutheran sources. They're constantly citing this idea because it really is a key for how they understand sanctification and how they understand Christology. You read Martin Kamnitz on the two natures of Christ. Uh, he will cite St. Athanasius saying that God became man that man might become God. Of course, you have to understand that in the proper context because that, you know, sounds a little strange to be saying that we become... Um, God is God is God, you know, our, like a, in a Mormon sense, uh, what's, what's called apotheosis. Do we become gods of the same kind as, as he is? No, of course not. But we do share in the divine nature. We have to say that we share in the divine nature in, in to some extent because Peter says that. And that kind of language is there from the very beginning of the church. You find it in St. Irenaeus. You find it in Justin Martyr. You find it in Athanasius. I mean, it's it's universal in, in the church in the early centuries of the church near universal i don't want to say universal because i don't i don't know <laughs> there, there may be some significant fathers that didn't speak in that language i'm not sure so i don't I want to be careful about how i say things um but it is near universal in, in the early church that there is some concept of, of deification or, or theosis or a participation or sharing in the divine nature um you see this in luther's thoughts and again you see it in gerhard it's i have a book on this coming out um but I think one of the ways that you maybe see this most clearly is in the Theologia Germanica. Now, the Theologia Germanica is a work written by an anonymous author. Uh, we republish it, so you can get a, you can get our edition of it, um, jspublishing.org. It's a it's an older it's a nineteenth century translation. We didn't do a new translation, but it is a nice format. It's part of our devotional classic series. It's a really good book. And Luther made the claim that this work was more influential on him than anything else, uh, except for possibly St. Augustine. And if you want to see some more work on this, uh, Theology of the Heart by Bengt Hoffman um, does a great, he's a great book. That's a great, wonderful, wonderful text. I think he totally misunderstands scholasticism, though. When he gets to Lutheran scholastics, I mean, I have so many criticisms of the way that he he just totally mishandles quenched at, especially. But... But, but the others too. Um, but he makes, he makes the point that Luther, we have a lot of the volumes that Luther actually read and underlined and put, took notes in. And throughout his writings, we usually see a kind of yes and no, sick or non, uh, throughout you know, the margins to say like, I agree with this or I don't agree with that. And he does that through a ton of writings, even ones that he really loves, like Bernard of Clairvaux and stuff, you can see that. He doesn't have any nones in the Theologia Germanica. I mean, he he says that, he, he tries to use this to prove that none of our theology is new. Now, I challenge you to read that. I challenge you to read that book and ask yourself what it's about and how it differs from a Calvinist understanding of the Christian life. Because a lot of understandings of Luther's theology don't make sense with that book. And I've seen a lot of arguments that, that try to people try to argue, well, Luther really liked just these couple things in the book and he didn't really understand what the author was saying. Luther reprinted it, he gave it the title, he affirmed everything in it in his notes. He never repudiated it throughout his life. It even played a role in Lutheran piety after that, not super extensively in everyone, but at least to an extent. I know Johann Arndt, that was a big proponent of that work. John Calvin read that same book and he called it Dangerous Poison. I guess th that's such an interesting contrast because this is a book that Luther said summarizes the whole Christian life. And he said it was the best book ever written. I mean, basically. And Luther, of course, was known for overstatement. So, like, who knows if he really thought that. But at the time he wrote it, he said it. So he may have said that about other books, too, because, like I said, Luther was prone to overstatement. But 
so a work that Luther would recommend as the closest to his own theology is one that Calvin calls dangerous poison. That shows you that they're not exactly in the same place in terms of their spirituality and that the disagreements between them is not something that is so minor as to be just the mode of Christ's presence in the supper, as I often hear. It's something more core than that. To have them both read this book and take such opposing views of it. And if you read the book, it's very mystical. You know, Lutherans don't like mysticism. I, I defend mysticism. Uh, I will be defending mysticism in my book. Uh, by the end, I defend what is what I call Lutheran mysticism. Um, I, I've already defended Lutheran scholasticism, so I might as well get myself into more trouble at this point. What am I? What have I got to lose? Uh, so, it, it depends what we mean by mysticism, though, of course, because I think often, unfortunately, the the rise of the charismatic movement has, in many ways, really totally altered how we've understood the term mysticism because mysticism became identified then with enthusiasm, which is this kind of revelationary experience of God apart from the means of grace. And that's not what I'm talking about when I say Luther is a mystic. It's a very different kind of mysticism, but it, the older sense of the word that is to be identified with some of those really important medieval figures like a Bernard of Clairvaux, like John Towler and the Theologia Germanica. Those are the three main sources for Luther's mysticism. If you look at those sources, and then if you look at Luther and his incorporation of those, and then Luther, and then Gerhard's devotional writings, you have a, a mysticism that is very much a word sacrament centric mysticism. It's not enthusiasm. It's very different than enthusiasm. So I want to make that clear. Um, I'm kind of trying to recapture these terms as they have meant historically. I think they've it's been abused. So when most Lutherans criticize mysticism, I, I would agree with them. By the way, I, I, in what they're criticizing. But I think it's wrong to use that term because the term has such a rich and important history within Luther's thought and within Lutheran thought. Um, we, we shouldn't be skeptical of experience. We shouldn't be skeptical of even things like emotion. Well, you know, th those are like good God created things. It, it just depends if it's tied to the means of grace, you know, the objective word and sacrament or something that is totally divorced from that with just this internal religious experience, totally devoid of the external means of grace and, and this you know, introspection and all of these things that I've criticized, you know, at, at length in many places. So that kind of mysticism is not good, but there's a kind of mysticism that's good. And so if you read that work, it's basically all about theosis. I mean, that's that's the point of the book. Uh, it's, a, it's about the surrender of self to God and the filling of God within us that changes us. Um, it, it's the passive reception of this kind of mystical union that that is emphasized there. So it's not about this active life of works or earning something, but it is about this inward transformation, though God is the one doing it. Um, it's been said that Luther has a passive spirituality. Uh, John Kleining, for example, says that, and, and Oswald Bayer, as much as I criticize him, says that. And I think, I think he's, he's absolutely right. There certainly is a passive spirituality in Luther, and it's a passive kind of mysticism that you find there that really makes it different. It's not a, uh, because what you see in a lot of medieval mysticism is you've got these, um, you know, these kind of steps that lead, and I can do more programs in depth on some of these, the, the specifics here, but um, you have this, this number of steps, you know, you have this purgation of your sin, you're illuminated, eventually you reach this goal of union with God, which is a goal to be reached. For Luther, the mysticism is kind of flipped on its head. He's not, it's not that he's against this Christian experience, but it's that our Christian experience flows out of the end, and that the end is brought to the beginning. Okay, so that because of Christ and the incarnation, we do have union with God. In faith, we have perfect union with God. That's been accomplished for us in Christ. And our piety and devotion then is not an attempt to gain union with God, but it flows out of the union God has already given us freely and completely in Christ. That's a, so it's very different in that way. And that's where this passive spirituality informs his mysticism so that this this practical Christian piety is one of, of you know, he's constantly speaking of joy and he speaks of, he uses language of raptus or the, the rapture um, of, of this, these kind of experiences of extreme joy that he has in the gospel, um, which is not for him. Again, it's, it's, it doesn't flow out of, I've done enough, I've fasted this much, but it's joy and delight in the fact that we have union with God in Christ perfectly accomplished for us. And now we live this life of joyful piety and devotion out of the union that's already been accomplished.
Um, so it, it definitely is, is distinguished from other mysticism in that way. So where, where I think this, this relates is to what I'm talking about here is this is the idea that the, the finite is capable of the infinite. And you see how in this idea of theosis, because there is this kind of fear of bl blurring the cr creature creator distinction, that the reforms don't want to use that kind of language to the same extent. They're, they're kind of fearful of theosis because it seems to blur that line. So you do have some that use kind of theosis language to some degree, but most of them qualify it. I'm not an expert in all reformed sources, so someone can certainly point me to figures that, that did speak more explicitly of this. And, and there very well may be. There's been work trying to defend that Calvin had a view of theosis. Um, you know, he had a strong doctrine of union with Christ. There are some parallels for sure. And I'm not discounting that there's any doctrine like that in Calvin, but what I'm saying is there's still a difference between that and where Luther's going. Luther is much less um, afraid of that blending of the infinite, finite, and infinite, because for Luther, the finite is capable of the infinite without becoming the infinite. And, and see, that's where the Calvinist principle is really very different, is for, for the Reformed, it tends to be the case that there is a fear that if the infinite can, or if the finite can contain the infinite, then the finite becomes the infinite. But that's not what Luther, that's, that's, that's not the principle that we hold to. We, we hold, you know, it's not like we deny the creature-creator distinction. God is absolutely transcendent, but we, if we share in God or participate in God, whether that's through our general union that all things have with God, or if it's through that mystical union that we have with Christ, partaking of God and sharing in God is not being God. There is a difference between God and those who share in God. Um, complete difference like like we are ontologically like totally different we are totally other than god uh and, and i think that's apparent in you know my defenses of, of classical theism in so many ways um that you know because the criticism of classical theism is that it makes god you know unknowable by humanity because he's so other um so I don't know how you could say that I've, you know, kind of blurred the, the distinction there, but maybe you would. Um, I know that the Eastern Orthodox uh, listeners will say that, you know, my, the fact that I don't use the essence energies distinction precisely means that I'm doing what the Reformed are accusing of, us of too. I will say this, though, that there is language of actually the energetic presence of God in relation to mystical union. Energeia is the term that is used there. It shows. It does show up in Gerhard too, by the way, in his Christology. So, as far as I know, I haven't found anything that delves too deep into that. But there may even be a bit of a precedent in Lutheran history for having a kind of distinction like that as well. So that's interesting. But how that relates to to Christology and the question of Christology is this: that if the infinite, or the finite, is not capable of the infinite, then Christ's human nature cannot experience a kind of deification. If I can't even, if I can't experience a deification, Christ can't experience a deification. Now, if he can't, I really can't, right? Um, and this, this is what leads the Reformed to say that Christ's human nature does not have any divine properties, where the Lutheran tradition would say that there is a communication of that which is divine to the human nature of Christ. So that because of this intimate union of, of infinite and finite in the mystery of the hypostatic union, because it is possible for the infinite to be within the finite without the finite becoming infinite, that this is an absolute possibility that Jesus exercises divine attributes because of the nature of the theanthropic person so that Jesus can be omnipresent according to his human nature. He can be omniscient according to his human nature. He can receive divine worship according to his human nature. He has divine authority according to his human nature. And there's textual evidence for every single one of these claims. And that's what we're going to get into in future podcasts, because this is all just background. <laughs> and I thought this may happen. We may just get background uh, in terms of this broader principle, the finite and the infinite. Uh, which, which I think do think is very important. I will say this though, just one argument for you to, to, to consider as we get into the specifics next time that we address this. Um, 
If you don't believe that it's possible for anything that is divine to be communicated to the human nature, how do you explain that it is the divine person that assumes a human nature? Or in other words, how do you explain the impersonality of the human nature of Christ? Because Christ's human nature doesn't isn't a person. If Christ's human nature is a person and the divine nature is a person, there are two persons and now you're an historian. So what you have to say is that this human Jesus is a divine person. He receives his personhood from the eternal son, from the Logos. If that's the case, you have to believe in a communication of the divine to the human, or else there is no personhood of Christ. That includes the human nature. Just think about that. I'll leave you with that. Uh, and thanks so much for watching and listening. Uh, this conversation can get kind of technical. I thought it was important to get some of the background here before I got really into just the three genera. So we'll be getting into some of that discussion, but hopefully this, this background and some of these kind of underlying ideas help you to think through some of this and we'll get into the specifics as we do this. Maybe next week, we may take a break and go back to some other things and then come back to this, but it'll be soon. So thanks so much for watching and or listening. We'll see you next time. God bless.